Good evening. My name is Mehran Kamrava. I'm the director of the Center for International and Regional Studies here at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Qatar. I'm delighted to see all of you. Welcome, and it, you are in for a huge treat tonight. We will introduce our distinguished speaker and honored guest in a minute, but before we do so, let me take a minute to uh, attend to some housekeeping points. If I could please ask all of you to turn your telephones off or put them on vibrate. A summary of tonight's lecture will be on our website, cirs.georgetown.edu, within the next few days. I encourage all of you to sign up uh, in order we, uh, so that we can get in touch with you and put you on our list for our future events. A sign-up sheet is uh, right outside the hallway outside. QTEL has kindly uh, made tonight's lecture available on USB disks, and uh, uh, you will be able to get them tonight as you leave uh, the auditorium. Uh, we have um, a small reception prepared uh, in our main uh, lobby area uh, after tonight's talk. It is a rich tradition here at Georgetown uh, for us to choose one of our outstanding students to introduce our distinguished speaker. I'm pleased to have one of my own best students introduce our distinguished speaker for the evening. Ali Althani is a senior majoring in culture and politics with a focus in Middle Eastern studies. He is currently also pursuing a certificate in Arab and Regional Studies on the topic of Saudi rentier responses to the Arab Spring. Ali has previously worked for HSBC Bank and is currently at QTEL. Actually, he's currently at the Ministry of Business and Trade and he has been involved in Rota's charity trip to Nepal. He's been also involved in a number of extracurricular activities here on campus, and most importantly, he had a midterm exam in my class earlier today, in which I'm sure he did well when I read his exam. I haven't done it yet. Please join me in welcoming Ali to the stage. Thank you, Professor Kamrava, for the very kind introduction. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ladies and gentlemen, Honored guests, technological advancement has been progressing at an exponential rate over the past few decades. Tonight, we are very lucky to have with us His Excellency Sheikh Abdullah bin Mohammed bin Saud Al Thani to share with us his thoughts on this very important topic. In his capacity as Chairman of the Board of Directors of QTEL Group and its parent company Qatar Telecom, His Excellency has been a driving force behind QTEL's expansion in the telecommunications industry globally and regionally. He has had an illustrious career at various levels of the Qatari state, including having served as chief of the Mir Diwan, and currently he enjoys the rank of state minister. Internationally, he takes part as a member of the ITU Telecom Board and as broadband commissioner at the United Nations. He has been instrumental in the corporate restructuring of Qatar Telecom and in expanding QTEL from a national telecommunications operator to a group with a presence in 17 different countries spanning North Africa to Southeast Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Sheikh Abdullah bin Mohammed bin Saud Al Thani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Distinguished guests, ambassadors, and professors, students, ladies and gentlemen. Just before I start, by the show of hand, who stayed late last night? Well, I did. So stay awake with me huh? and keep me awake. <laughs> OK, usually I would uh, be talking to people from the industry about this topic. Tonight, it is different. I truly, I'm truly excited to talk and share ideas with young minds like yours. I always like to start by giving an overview about QTEL. 
because I'm very proud of it, and the great journey we, we had since the year 2000. But before that, I just want to say one thing. Tonight, I'm supposed to be in Algeria for a meeting with the Prime Minister and some officials tomorrow morning at around 10 o'clock. I wouldn't let anything to take me from this occasion. So I made it to come, and as soon as I finish from here, I have to head to the airport straight away. My team is waiting so, that, so we can catch up the flight and reach by tomorrow morning. I will just allow a few, a few questions, but I will leave my Twitter account. If someone misses uh, some of the questions, please do uh, tweet me. So, my agenda for today is, I will talk for almost half an hour, and I will touch on three parts. First, I will start with the Qutar journey and the growth and the ambitions we had. Second, I will be, I will be talking about the trend in the telecom industry, and why it matters. And finally, the impact of technology on the Arab world. I will take you for an overview of a QTEL. Before I joined the QTEL board, I met with His Highness, and I could see clearly the vision he had for the country. I had a clear plan for bringing QTEL in line with that vision. With a small country, small population, Incoming competition, business is not as usual. So the board composed a new strategy, which included first restructuring our company, assessing all the staff, and then setting a clear goals. From there, we called it the Falcon strategy. Falcon strategy came into life. No more local company. Our vision of enriching people lives means that we are focused on people and making a difference. And this also reflects the fact that we have broadened our scope to include data, media, and technology. Our three by three strategy focuses on three business segments and the three regions. The three business segments are wireless, broadband, and managed services. In 2005, we were one country operation. Today, we have a presence in 17 markets across Middle East, North Africa, the Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia. Now, I would like to spend a few minutes to take you through the QTEL journey since the year 2000, or if you want to call it the Y2K. QTEL started in the 2000, year 2000 with the new board, as I said, we went through a very uh, excellent and big exercise of transformation, restructuring the company, assessing all the staff, putting everybody in the right place. If we had gaps, we started to bring people from abroad, very talented people, because we were planning to go outside. The first move outside Qatar were in the year 2005. We went into a fierce competition, competition in Oman against companies from the region, companies from uh, international uh, world. We won Oman, and we called it Nauras. That opened the appetite for QTEL to go even further. In 06, we had a sort of a joint venture with AT&T and Navlink to deliver managed services to businesses and also data centers for countries in Qatar and outside Qatar, of course, in the Middle East. Zero seven. I'm, let's, uh, I'm ju I just want to say one thing here. I am very proud of this, uh, of this slide. This slide is very close to my heart. Wherever I go, to whomever I, I talk, I always bring this slide. If you, if you look into my pocket, you might find it in my pocket. <laughs> so the big jump, the big transformation happened in zero seven when we acquired Watania in Kuwait. It was at that time called the biggest deal in the Middle East. Under Wataniya came Algeria, Tunisia, Palestine, of course Kuwait, and the Maldives, small business in Saudi Arabia. Months later, we went and acquired Asia Cell in Iraq. Again, one of the biggest companies in Iraq. Turned it over very quickly. I'm proud of it. Same year, we went and bought a stake in Star Hub. And with the Star Hub came two countries underneath it. 
Laos and Cambodia plus Singapore, of course. Now, 08 is the second really big transformation in Q10 when we went and acquired Indosat in Indonesia. It is the second biggest or second largest company in Indonesia, one of the largest company in the uh, Southeast Asia. Here we had to stop. And the board, we said, come on, it is too much to, to uh, swallow. We have to think and revise our uh, strategy. We just can't go and acquire. We have to take the advantage and, uh, and uh, take the organic growth and the value from the companies we are in. So what happened that? We went into 09 and increased our stake from 42%, as you could see, to 65% in Indosat. In, zero, in 2011, we went to Louisiana and we acquired a stake from 50% back to 75%. 2012, I'm sure some of you heard, if you, if you follow the news, we went and acquired a stake, bigger stake in Asia Cell from 32 to about 44%, and inshallah, in the first quarter of next year, we are planning to go to 60%. We are just waiting for more approvals. A month ago, I'm sure all of you heard. We increased our stake in Wataniya. Again, it was called the biggest deal in Kuwait and in Kuwait stock market. As you could see, we're very proud of this. It is clear that we have been on an exciting journey and we have invested wisely and brought organic growth to all our operations. Now, a quick look at, my, at some of the KPIs from 2005 until today. As you can see, there has been significant growth. We moved from one market to 17 markets. From half a million to 89 million customers. Revenues from 640 million to almost 9 billion US dollars. That's from 2005 until today. We have more than tripled our enterprise value. So how does my uh, group compare with its peers globally and in the region? In terms of revenue, the Qtel Group has been the fastest telecom company in the world since 2006, with a compounded annual growth rate of 57% from 2006 to 2010, and a rate of 48% if we take into account 2011. It's clear that we have done better than our peers in the region, and we have also done far much better than international players. Now, how is my company different from the rest of the players in the telecom space? Most of our revenues come from international operations. A further solid reason behind our global expansion. Furthermore, we have a good mixer, mix of mature markets where mobile penetration is high, as such as the GCC, and also an emerging market or growth market uh, where there is still room to grow, like Algeria and Iraq. Market position, we are always number one or number two in all markets we operate in. We are also maintaining our leading position here in Qatar. We will continue to see growth in voice services, especially in emerging markets where people always like to talk. As voice prices fall, we see customers taking advantage of lower price rates and attractive packages. So what are the key success factors of our journey? Our success starts from strong leadership and clear vision. And for students here, please take the clear vision as, as a lesson. Since the beginning, we've laid out ambitious goals and we will continue to do so in order to achieve our targets. We also recognize the importance of people talent. To succeed, we need exceptional people and effective governance. Attracting and retaining the very best talent and developing our leaders, focusing on values, culture, and engagement is a must. Strong execution is what enables success. It's all about translating vision into action. Before I go into my second part 
of my topics. I would like to show you a two minutes or a two minute video. It begins with an empty space, a blank piece of paper. But you always need to start somewhere. The telephone. This was once state of the art. Today, well, it's just an antique. It used to take 80 days to travel around the world. Now, it takes a nanosecond. The mobile phone is so much more than we ever thought possible. 90% of the world's population connected by a mobile network. Instant contact with whoever you want, wherever you are. Smarter chips, quicker networks, cutting edge technologies, allowing people to do what they want, when they want. So where does Qtel fit into all this? We started simply. A company born of local customs and traditions, providing a network for the people of Qatar. Our achievements helped modernize the nation and connect Qataris to the outside world. For the last five years, we've had a vision to be in the top 20 telecommunications companies by 2020. And it's a vision that's driven us to experience incredible growth. Smart acquisitions have turned us from a strong local provider to the fastest growing telecoms group by revenue in the world. And that's where we are now. We're on a journey. We've achieved much already. But with the global marketplace changing at breakneck speed, it's time to stop looking backwards. Looking forward, I will be now looking at what's happening in our industry today and the opportunities being created. So what's happening in the industry today? Current trends in the industry are challenging our position as operators. Slow growth, more competition, falling prices, and new innovation are all threatening our established revenue stream. And we have only been partially able to take the full advantage of the data explosion which, which is transforming the communication. So who are the telecom uh, players in the space? Telecom operators are facing competition from non-telecom operators in various segments of the value chain. Media players, as you could see, are already investing in the internet services. Retailers like Best Buy, Carphone, Carphone Warehouse are already offering telecom services. Infrastructure providers, as uh, Nokia and Ericsson, are also our vendors uh, are, all, are also our vendors and involved in the, into the network operation. Handset manufacturers like Sony, Apple, and BlackBerry have already entered into the business of telecom service. Internet and software uh, players, or what we call them the overtop players, are already in the telecom airspace and the telecom space. Over recent years, players such as Skype. Google, Apple, and Facebook have, have started playing a greater role in the telecom value chain. So, is it gloomy? How does the future look like? I look at it from the bright side. Although we need to adapt to these realities, we are also presented with incredible opportunities. The reach of mobile communication is extending rapidly. There are six billion customers connected today. By the year 2014, the number of mobile connections will surpass the global population. Four out of five connections are made in the developing world. Most people in the developing countries visit the internet for the first time through smartphones. Usage continues to grow. Customers are spending more time on mobile devices and on the internet. Just most of you, please answer me. When you go to a majlis or you go to any coffee shop with your friends and peers, you will see 90% of the group heads down on their smartphones. Hardly they talk to each other. <laughs> so when I think of a mobile phone, I see it as a Swiss army knife. A host of online services 
and applications are already making mobile and smartphones even more powerful, more powerful by combine, combining several functions. For example, Instagram enables the vast sharing of photos and videos over different devices or social networks. More and more people use their mobile device as a portal to the content and applications available in the online world. Accessing the internet, navigation, navigation devices, reading the news, using it as a wallet, game console, instant messaging, social media, camera, video, television, almost everything. So what are the potential, what are the potential markets to consider for growth? It's a busy schedule, a busy, busy slide, huh? I will take you through it, each, each one by one. I'm joking. Telecom operators have the opportunity to enter adjacent industry. There are tons of possibilities. The key is to define new business models and, def and redefining existing ecosystem. So what a trend will drive our hyper-connected world? Here I have identified eight key trends that I believe will drive high, high usage. First, top of the, line, of the list, status update. Second, location-based services. Third, better access to healthcare and government services. Fourth, crowdsourcing and project management. Fifth, expressing like and dislike. I'm sure you've seen this on YouTube. Sixth, privacy or the demise of privacy. Seven, converged services. And finally, data on the cloud. Just before I move into my third part, I would like to summarize of what, what I just said. We, we have, uh, you know, uh, we just, uh, we must understand that there are more opportunities for telecom operators, for operators, or to capture in the future. And the focus is going to be in education, in health, and media, and content. It's important for us as telecom operators to have a right partnership with the service provider. Now I will move into my third and major part of my remarks tonight, which is about how technology has impacted the Arab world. I'm sure most of you are now waiting to hear what, what I'm, am I going to say. But first, I would like to take you, uh, I would like to share with you some of recent statistics about social media. I will start with uh, Facebook, uh, you know, uh, facts and figures. So there are 46 million Arab users on Facebook. Of this group, 70% are between 15 to 29 years old, and the majority are male. In the Arab region, only a third of the Facebook users are women. The ratio has not changed since last year. Globally, it's always uh, around 50-50. There are four reasons for this gender gap, and I will come to gender gap later. Reason number one, number one social and cultural constraint upon, upon women. Number two, privacy and security concern. Three, access to technology. And reason number four is education and ICT literacy. From January to March 2011, the usage of Facebook increased by more than 30% across the whole Middle East. And now, I'll just take you through the facts and figures on Twitter. There are over 1.3 million active Twitter users in the Arab world. Some of you might say the percentage of this population on Twitter is small. But its impact has been large, I'm sure you've, you've all noticed that. Since enabling Arabic on Twitter platform last year, Arabic has become the fastest growing language on Twitter. Social media access was considered so critical so, uh, to the Arab Spring that regimes in Egypt, Libya, and now in Syria tried to quell the social movement by blocking access to social media or to the internet altogether. They failed to do that. Later, they all used the same site to promote their agenda to the people. So how is the Arab world using social media compared to the rest of the world? As you can see from, the, from this chart, in the West, 
places like UK and the US, they use, they use the social media for ledger. In China and Hong Kong, it's all about education and learning. In Russia and Eastern Europe, it's about community and connecting with others. But when we, when we look in the Middle East, we see that many use social network for earning respect from others, but also, importantly, changing others' opinion. That's why, during the Arab Spring, users naturally turned to social media to spread information. Now, what are the trending topics in social media, globally and in the region, here? Top global trending topics in March 2011 were, and I'm sure most of you will remember, a 13-year-old singer singing about Friday, a full moon that was so bright they called it super moon, concern in Latin America about H1N1 flu, or a polar bear in Berlin Zoo passed away. Well, in the Arab world, the top trending topics were hashtag Bahrain, Syria, Egypt, January 25, and protest. Social media has become a powerful tool for social change in the Arab states. This is clearly illustrated by a survey in March 2011 that 90% of Egyptians and Tunisians use social media to organize or spread the awareness of a protest. So what is the impact of social media in the Arab world? Over the last two years, protests in the, protests in the region have been captured by smartphones, cameras, and sent around the world. Mobile technology helps the youth feel empowered and have their voice heard. Social media is impacting the private sector in a fundamental way. For companies, the opportunity to have direct contact with their customers is both challenging and liberating. I can tell you from my own experience. Last year, I set up my own Twitter account. Suddenly, customers could contact me directly with concern, questions, and idea. Please, don't tweet me saying, when the fiber optic coming to my house, or why, or why the reception in my area is not working. You get hold into the CEO of a Q-Tin. Here, there he is. Digital technology is increasing the, increasing the expectation of transparency and accountability from government bodies and officials. Now, I would like to take a closer look at the Arab digital generation. This is a very important topic. Please bear with me. In what has been to, know, to be known as the Arab digital generation or the ADG, the ADG is defined as a 15 to 35 year old with a technology gadget, having access to the internet with at least one account on a social network. The ADG represent 4% of the digitally active globally. And in addition, the study also profiled that the Arab digital generation as politically active, educated, and independent. And that family still represent their most important social unit. The study also revealed that 80% of the Arab digital generation would give up TV if they had a choice between uh, internet and TV. While I agree with this, 15 to 35 age group established in this survey by Booz and Google for the ADG, I believe the minimum age is far below than 15. I, I will share with you a true story. I have a five, year, a five years old daughter. She got upset with her mother. She disappeared for a couple of minutes. She came back and she looked at her mother. She said, I deleted your apps from the laptop. I swear, I swear this is what happened. I know you won't, some of you won't believe that. Her mother got upset. I said to her, come here. How, do you, how you did that? She just showed me how, she just showed me how she did it. So I said, can you bring it back? She said, yeah, you go to app store and you bring it back. So I will leave the conclusion to you guys. <laughs> so portion of the digitally active youth in the Arab world is on par with all developing region, like Latin America, and is rapidly increasing here. The Arab digital generation represent 
a 10 million strong base today, it's set to grow to 14 million by the 2014. The Arab digital generation evolves and grows, so will the Arab world and society. The Arab digital generation will have a significant impact on the Arab world's future. Let's take a quick look at the Arab digital generation consumption habit. The study observed that ADG time on the internet is on par with the global market, and its video consumption is higher than most developed market. The ADG also increasingly accessing internet while they are on the move, rather than just from home. The ADG is as connected and as collaborative as the youth in the Western world, except more exchange of ideas between the two is still needed. So how the Arab digital generation changing the Arab society? The study made it clear that Arab digital generation is business-minded and will be a key economic growth engine for the region going forward. Really sound good, huh? The Arab digital generation, generation further believes it has more freedom and choice, even on a traditionally conservative subject like spouse choice. Finally, and contrary to the popular belief, the ADG has not lost touch with its religious heritage. It believes that technology actually brought it closer to, religious, to religion. While the ADG will fundamentally change Arab society, it will do so keeping our rich tradition and value intact. So how does the Arab digital generation look at e-commerce? This is the weakest part. From the start, it is clear that the Arab digital generation is not participating significantly in the e-commerce. However, it's increasingly relying on the internet for its research on which products to buy. Research online and purchase offline metrics are closer to the global averages. As the ADG economy evolves, I believe the next Amazon, Google, and Facebook will come from our region, from the Arab world. So how does the Arab digital generation view the power of technology to transform key sectors? The ADG believes in the ability of ICT to fundamentally transform key sectors and wants ICT to be a tool to transform healthcare, education, and government processes. ADG will demand more and more integration of ICT in other sectors, building world-class capability in the, region, in the regional sector and improving our economy, economic competitiveness. Now, how are we in QTEL bringing technology benefits to the communities we serve in? QTEL Group is providing life-enhancing services such as mobile money. Here in Qatar, for instance, our customers can now transfer money in Qatar and to overseas destination through mobile wallet using safe, convenient, fast, and easy-to-use mobile money services. Also, with near-field communication, I'm sure some of you has used that, near-field communication chips embedded into mobile, like the BlackBerry, we are enabling people to pay with their device and replace the need for cash and credit card. In mobile health, we are providing SMS health advice in Kuwait, Iraq, and in Palestine. While in mobile learning, we are enabling English learning through mobile phone in Tunisia in, in, in collaboration with the State Department, U.S. State Department. And now, how are we in the group addressing the gender gap? Gender gap is a very uh, hot topic these days at the ITU level, and we've been addressing it every time we meet uh, in, in the board, at ITU level, I mean, I'm not cute. A recent ITU study revealed that there is a significant global gender gap. A woman is 21% less likely to own a mobile phone than a man. Mobile phones and broadband have proven to be a powerful tool to foster women economic empowerment. In Iraq, we launched a dedicated offering for women, the Almas line, which means the diamond. In one year, 1.2 million women in Iraq have been connected to their friends and families, 
and are becoming more socially and financially independent due to their access to mobile technology. At this year's Barcelona GSMA con Congress, and in collaboration with Sherry Blair Foundation, we designed a service specifically for stay-at-home moms, including a family finder feature for Indonesian. We are also providing Indonesian women with relevant information on small business management, life skills, health, and child care. We need to pay attention to the digital uh, divide and consider accessibility, affordability, and digital literacy. Providing women with access to ICT tools, such as mobile phone, can lead to a better quality of life and wider economic growth. Empowering more women with mobile phones can accelerate social economic development. In conclusion, the biggest potential of new technology and mobile technology in particular is about empowering people to discover their full economic and social potential. By providing access to new ideas, a new source of finance and information. However, with such rapid technological change, serious challenges are arising due to a lack of deep structural change that comes with civilizational change. As business leaders, citizens, students, governments, institutions, we all need to rise to the occasion and use our influence to inspire, engage, and create opportunities for the next generation. Overall, leaders in the Arab world should view these changes as positive. Governments should introduce information technology in their, active, in, the, in their activities, promote digital culture and economic activities that are creating new jobs. There is need for a clear policy leadership. Policymakers must come together to formulate common strategy on com and converge ICT policy aligned with other policy areas such as energy, health, education, and the climate in order to maximize the impact of ICTs. Governments play a critical role in convening the private sector, public institution, civil society, and individual citizens to outline a vision for a connected nation. Through communications and technology, the Arab, the Arab digital generation will help shape the future of industry, of industry and society, capturing economic and social value to ensure the growth and stability in the region as a whole. Thank you for, your, for listening.